Should we do a sound check? Is that good? Yeah, I'm just gonna do a thing and I'm gonna walk up. Sounds good. Yeah, do it again. Sound check it again. Hey, uh, I just wanted to say uh, we're here filming a movie and we came here for you. It's Lucas Nelson and Promise of the Real. My name is Bradley Cooper. We're making a Star Wars board. So I'm gonna walk into this. Go! I wanted to direct something. And I always wanted to tell a love story because it just feels like something that everybody can relate to. A Star is Born, the history of it, obviously has been proven to be a timeless tale. It's a wonderful journey of making a movie. It is a collaborative art form, and that's why I love it so much. Everybody was invested in a way that felt like it was way more than a job. And you know, I spent the last three years doing this. The whole idea of this movie was to be authentic. I knew that I had the real deal with Lady Gaga, so she really set the bar. If the rest of the movie didn't match her authenticity, the story was never gonna take off. I feel like A Star Is Born chose me from the very beginning. When me and Bradley first really met at my house, I just had all the confidence in the world in him, and I just already was in awe of him as an actor. I found I met this incredibly open, compassionate, warm, giving person. And I knew that the camera was gonna love her face and her eyes and her whole energy. And I thought, if I can capture that, if I can write a character, if Eric Roth and I and Will Fetters can write a character that facilitates and utilizes all of her strengths, that it could be, it could be a home run. But Earth's on the sky, burning in your eyes. Ali, in a lot of ways, was me. I had brown hair and was behind a piano writing songs. And, you know, when she says, all anyone ever said is they liked the way that I, you know, sounded, but they didn't like the way that I looked. I mean, these, these are things that happened to me in real life. You look at me, babe, I want to catch you on fire. Everybody already knows she has the voice. So if I could introduce people to the person also, the actor in this character, Ali Campana, then I thought it could be a lethal combination. I had come to a point where I wasn't gonna make the movie unless it was with her. And that screen test was the moment that I could put onto film the thing that I felt that we had, which was this incredible chemistry. Um, and that really was the goal, even though these characters weren't really even born yet. I mean, Jackson Maine didn't even exist when I shot that test, uh, but luckily she was great. So it wound up being, uh, for me, selfishly, a great sort of test run, using it as an opportunity to direct, because that actually was the first time I ever directed anything. You were just meant to be a director, and I just got lucky enough to be the girl in your first film. I think that we met at the perfect time. Like, and, and, and which is still shocking. Who would ever, ever think that you and I, that's the pairing? Right. You know, but we, it really is true that, that, like you said, you always wanted to be an actress, and you've done incredible work as an actress, but nothing really, uh, you never got to bite off like this kind no, of thing. No, no. And, and, and it's a bit transition. Oh, it's a huge you know? transition. And, and that's the thrill. That's what I was so happy about for you, was that you really got to experience the thrill of acting. So Jack sent me to pick you up and take you to the gig. I can't go to the gig, I gotta go to work. He's very much looking forward to this. Thank you, I really appreciate that, but I, I gotta go, I'm, I'm sorry. So I can't leave. I'll be in my car just right down the street. Okay, you do that. Okay, bye. Bradley was a tremendous director. I mean, he really taught me how to just let the lines go, let any thoughts or the cerebral nature of acting go, and to just be there and, and, and be in the circumstances of the moment. I dyed my hair and took my makeup off. And that allowed me to open up, to be vulnerable, to put you know, my pain, my despair, my uh, insecurities on film. 
We really both met each other at the same point individually in our work, and we both needed the same thing from each other in order to jump tracks to this yes. other place. The very first thing that we did was go like, okay, you're a musician, right. and, I, and I'm an actress, and we're gonna make an exchange. Yeah. And, and it, it was... It was really from that first meeting. It was really from that first meeting that it just was like a bomb that went off. Lady Gaga really encouraged me to find Jackson's voice through just trial and attempt. And you have to feel like the minute Jackson Maine enters the movie that, oh, there's this presence. I drove up to your house, and I don't know what gave me the balls to do it, but I said, hey, can we sing this song? Yeah. Where we went to her piano in the living room, and we did like one verse, and then you stopped, and you said, we should record this. You started to sing, and I was like, well, you wake up in the morning. Oh my gosh. You hear the work bell ring. This man has an incredible voice. And a multitude to the table. You sing from that vulnerable, guttural place that even some of the most famous singers in the world don't sing from. I took piano lessons and I took guitar lessons and voice lessons because, you know, singing is not easy and especially singing in front of a lot of people. So I had to spend, you know, five days a week for six months trying to learn how to sing. Watching you become a musician, it's just, it's been a pleasure. It's and a source of pride for us. It is, it, it, it is, it's, it's kind of just incredible. I remember thinking you were always a musician. It was just something that was untapped in you. And I was like, oh, well, all I gotta do is tell you to practice. <laughs> Perfect. Right? Yeah. It's a little crooked. Is that okay? Uh, crooked is good. Crooked is good. Sometimes I would get two verses sounding good and then a half of a verse would be off key. And, and he said, you know, you're gonna have to sing thousands of times before you sing in front of a live audience because that's the only way you can do it. Told my baby sister that her heart was gonna break. So woman, if I tell you that I love you, be okay. Cause I ain't lying. Yeah. No, I ain't lying. I lay it on the line. I had the sound in my head of what I wanted Jackson's guitar to sound like, and it was heavily influenced by Neil Young. His guitar strumming never floated around the neck. It attacked the neck. Three years ago, Neil enlisted my band, Promise of the Real, to be his backing band. It was the first time in my life my eyes have gone from Neil Young playing guitar to somebody else on stage, and I couldn't take my eyes off of him playing the guitar. We were talking about, so who are you going to cast as Jack's band? And it was like, who am I going to cast? No, no, real musicians, and it's going to be Promise of the Real. That's what's going to be. There is no Jackson Maine without Lucas Nelson. I mean, period. I got those magnetone amps and that 1956 Gibson Les Paul Jr. And that became Jack's sound. Yep. Yeah, man. Riding it, bro. This is the shit right here. Fucking getting out of the plane. like a full day of prep and then at like two in the morning meet these guys at the studio and work till four. I remember we wanted to go super country and, yep. then, we, and then we thought, well, why don't we just rock and roll? And yep. we had a lot of songs yeah. for this film and we only chose the ones that told the story. One of the first things that Mark said to me, okay, I know you can write a pop song, but what do you absolutely have to write about? Tell me something, boy. Aren't you tired trying to fill that void? We were writing it shallow from the point of view of Ali. Yeah, I had no idea it was going to become part of the narrative. And then you start like singing the opening line that was like, 
I really did get chills. And to hear you sing the lines, and you know, like you said, it was written for just Ali to sing it, and then it completely was flipped on its side yeah. when you sing it, because right. now it's like, tell me something, boy, tell me something, girl. Yeah. And it has this It's a very, story. very special duet. It becomes part of the reason that they fall in love. Tell me something, girl. Oh, my God. Are you happy in this modern world? Or do you need more? Is there something else you're searching for? I'm falling. There's no point where any lyric is sung that isn't directly related to exactly what their fear is, their hope, their dream. and filmmaking, it's collaborative. And the more you can allow something to grow and not try to control it, but curate it, is when you have the best product, I think, in the end. The best filmmakers I've ever worked with are the ones that listen. Can I just uh, have the, uh, the floor for rehearsal? One of the great things I learned from David O. Russell is to spend time with your casting and make sure that everybody has an entrance. And I just love, uh, you know, capturing certain faces and voices and eyes. And I can just keep a camera on all the people that are in this movie that never ceases to be interesting. Because all of these actors are so incredible. I'll never forget when you called me and you were like, Sam Elliott. He was kind enough to come to my house and we had dinner. And uh, I still remember you walking up the stairs, and I was like, holy fuck, there's Sam Elliott, holy shit. <laughs> and, uh, and then the minute, like, all... Think he's gonna make it up the stairs? <laughs> is, is he gonna make guy. it up the stairs? And then, but like all these people, the minute they, you lock eyes with them, they make you feel at ease. I kept hearing that you wanted to have this meeting. I'm like you, I, I get emotional about this thing, too. You know, like, probably everybody's sitting here. Yes. But. It was really an amazing thing to go in your house and have you play a soundtrack for me of you speaking in which it sounded uncannily like me. I told you I can't wear those things. When I wear them, it's just in my head and I need to be here with everybody else. How the, the doctor fuck am I gonna... said it's the only way to manage this thing, Jack. And I thought, what the fuck? <laughs> you say that in the movie. <laughs> I feel so connected to Sam in the way that I knew that I needed Jackson to feel connected, which was a strong male presence and who I want to admire me and love me. That's all Jackson wanted from Bobby. And we talked about it coming from his dad, too. It was wanting. Yeah. It was always wanting. But Bobby, like Jackson, still never healed. That's why he doesn't get out of the truck and hug his brother. When I said I would, you know, when I. Took your voice, you know. As you idolized, it wasn't that. Any kind of wound like that, I don't think it ever completely heals up. Right. You, you deal with it and you get you by deal with, with it, it, but it's... That's right. That scene is... That's a very powerful scene in this film. And that was the first take, dude. I remember. All the people that are in this movie, to me, have incredible features. And Andrew Dice Clay is somebody that I've always observed to be a very talented actor. I think I've seen every movie he's ever made. At that read-through, I say to Bradley, am I allowed to play with this, you know? And he goes, I'm expecting all of you. We see Ali sitting in a high chair, a towel around her, bathroom being made up by five different people. Lorenzo comes in the crowded room. How do I look? Not bad, huh? Who could have been a crooner? Your old man. You know what Paul said. Paul Anka told me 
Well, I could I tell told me, me I, had I had more natural talent right. than Frank. More natural. That's a direct quote. <laughs> That's right. More natural talent than Frank. That is a direct quote. Song swells. <laughs> Mario Lanza, live from London, 1958. La Morari, Morari, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing a play in London and Dave Chappelle came to see it. We met backstage and there was something about our dynamic that I just loved. And I thought, he's got to do this movie, he's got to play Jackson's old friend. And he did it in such a humorous and, and dramatic and soulful way. I saw you on YouTube, that video with the girl. Yeah. You made me happy, man. You look like you. That's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And it's such a pivotal point in the film because it's he provides the two roads for Jackson to go down. We would talk about a scene and he would create an environment that gave me like the courage to, to actually be vulnerable in a way that comedy wouldn't let me be. And on the set, it was amazing to watch because I can't even understand like the pressure of not just starring in it, you know, you know, producing, directing. That was great. I was learning so much watching you keep me in a comfortable and vulnerable and raw place where I could give you what you needed and wanted for the character. All the stuff you've gone through, all the insecurities, that's all beautiful food for your work. At first I thought he was nuts, and I've thought that for a minute. The first day I was there, he was in the scene with me, then he'd run out of the scene next to camera, start directing me, and run back in the scene and start acting. You know, there have been times in my life where I thought I was pretty sharp. Give me a break, not compared to him. I mean, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. People often ask, you know, is it hard to direct yourself? I found it to be easier, that it's almost like a bonus that you get to be on the field with the other actors, because you can make moves within the scene and direct within the scene, because you're actually a player in it, as if you're an athlete on a field, if you're a quarterback. It was amazing, dude. Like, when I wasn't on set doing something, I would just, like, find a nook and just watch you work. I would see you frame up, you know what I'm saying? I'd see you see the scene, and I'm like, yo, this is what it takes. And then we come out into here, and you could, could lead us, and then hinge, and we go out. Sure. Let's see what happens. The first day of shooting, we're just on the side of the road heading back to LA. We were shooting at a Mexican restaurant. I was sitting across the table with Lady Gaga, and um, I, I felt that p potentially she was wrapped up maybe in, in a preconceived idea of how the line should be read. You were talking to me, and I just kept saying the same line over and over again. You were like, I wanna, what's going on? You were like pointing across the room, and like you were trying to have a conversation with me, and I just kept saying the same line. I know very well what that feels like, so I just wanted her to get out of her head and, and, and move into this place, which I knew she already had in droves because we had worked for two months, just, just her and I prepping our characters together. And so it was just about, you know, finding a way for this energy to come through in front of the camera. Yeah, for real, that she was fucking doing it. No, you were fucking doing it. I was there, I fucking witnessed all. All the years I've done this, all the different sets I've been on, I love the culture of his set. I've been able to work with Clint Eastwood, you know, learning how one can create an environment and a tone on a set. That's how we do it, dude. <laughs> how we do it. How we fucking do it, bro. You all right? It's going to be a set that's going to demand a lot of you, but it should hopefully feel utterly safe, and that I'm going to walk off the cliff with you into that place of who knows what's going to happen. He's loose. He's not afraid to try something. Or, or to go with something different than what he had planned if he likes it better. He's very spontaneous. I felt very free in order to go to the margins of where the scene could be in order to try to get as many real moments as possible. You set the standard. We are in this together and there are no walls here. And there was no rules except not to fake it. Perfect. Amazing. I thank God we shot a Coachella. Billy Gerber was very smart about it. He said, let's, let's get some of the, the concert stuff right out of the gate. Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. First of all, it's great for the crew, for energy, and it also just sets the tone, and we're all gonna learn a lot. And I learned a tremendous amount about how I wanted to shoot it, 
and everything based on those next three days. I love so much your choice as the director to film from the stage so that we could see the audience yeah. and that we were always with the performer. The, the idea to shoot subjectively came out of a Metallica concert and I was behind the drum kit at Yankee Stadium and I could see the sweat on the back of Lars Ulrich's neck while at the same time getting the scope of the crowd. And that was the first time I thought, well, this composition in a film would be incredible because as a viewer, I would feel like I'm actually there with the artist and also feeling the, the breathtaking uh, experience that it must be to be on stage in front of that many people. Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. Then it's all about composition and camera movement. Those function as emotional ties to wherever each character is. Jack's coverage is handheld. Through his descent and her ascent, the camera starts to get smoother, the lens gets sharper, and the colors shift from a subjective perspective of Jack to something a little cleaner and eventually into more the white light of sobriety for Allie. A lot of times in the movie, the camera goes right to any time that's tactile in the beginning. You know, when he's wrapping the thing, when she touches his ear, when they, when he takes the thing off of her eyebrow, when their hands part, because you always remember the first touch of somebody. Oh, maybe it's time to let the always die. Thinking about these two characters, you know, how do they walk through life? That then informed how I was going to shoot both of them. And Jackson, to me, is somebody who has lived an internal life, being famous. He's being looked at all the time. So he's kind of avoiding it. So we're often shooting the back of his neck or profile as he comes to terms with his life and his past and the trauma that he had as a child. The camera slowly leaves him nowhere else to go. So by the end of the movie, when he's on the bed and he's decided whatever he's decided, the camera is right on his face, and there's no more hiding. That is some good news. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna go to Europe. Allie isn't even aware of her power, and so the camera's always looking at her right full on. One of my favorite uh, compositions is the beginning of the movie where she doesn't even know that she's being watched, where the movie is slowly saying, no, 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 we, we see it even if you don't. And then she hangs up the phone, she walks out to look in the mirror, all of a sudden the bathroom is a stage. And the movie is telling you that she's the star. Fucking man! I will never forget for as long as I live you coming and being like, I know what the, the beginning of the movie is now. As we're shooting the film, we were trying desperately to jump on live stages, and Stagecoach was occurring, and Willie Nelson and Jamie Johnson were kind enough to let us go on. We were just poised and ready to go, waiting and waiting and waiting, and we find out we have 10 minutes. I had just written this song, Black Eyes, I think like a week earlier, and I thought, God, this really feels like a beginning of a movie. Black Eyes open wide, it's time to testify. Yeah, that's it. That's kind of me as a filmmaker in this moment. That's Jackson. It was checking a lot of boxes that I thought were cool. But once we shot it, I thought, I don't know how I could have a better, a more powerful opening than this. As a filmmaker, he could pivot to moment to moment. And as a crew, we had to do the same thing. Rather than the piece of paper that tells you what you're shooting, it's like, well, let's be open to the beautiful things that might happen in between. And we would do that time and time again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chris Christopherson, as luck would have it, happened to be playing Glastonbury that summer. And I asked his wife, do you think that we could hop on stage right before Chris goes on? And she said, of course, anything you want. We had four minutes then. <laughs> Those flags, the hill that goes up, the pyramid stage, it's very iconic. But I thought, well, there's no way I can make a music movie that has any authenticity if Glastonbury isn't a part of it. It was just me, Maddie Labatique, and Steve Morrow the sound guy, that's all that traveled to Glastonbury. But then I had Lars Ulrich operating another camera. Lars Ulrich, it's like, why is Lars Ulrich operating a camera with Bradley Cooper? Lars was already there and we had a second camera. So I just said to Lars, uh, why don't you throw that camera on your shoulder and let's, let's go out there and that's how it happened. <laughs> because she lost her fiance in an accident. 
The last song in the movie uh, to me means a lot because it's the song that he wrote for her and then you're watching her sing it. I came to set and the stage was completely different than how I had uh, imagined it. So that was sort of took my breath away and I thought, oh my gosh. I wish I could. I remember that day very unfondly in a way because my very close friend died of cancer that day and I actually left the set. We were completely prepared for not to shoot. And then I remember I looked at her husband and I said, what do I do? And he said, do what Sonia would want you to do. She came back and she said, you know what? My friend would have wanted me to sing. So if you could help me today and really think of not just her, but how it feels to lose someone, think of her husband maybe for me. Uh, I think that that energy will penetrate this room. And I think, she, I'm pretty sure she's not in heaven yet. So, I think she'll hear us. It set her up for an even more emotionally charged performance of a song that's so meaningful and connected to exactly what had just occurred. This was not only about Ali having lost Jack and finding the strength to go perform in tribute to him, but also Gaga having to, to, to go through those exact same emotions as a human on that day, on, that, on set. We watched that character go through the grieving process during the song. She provided for all of us how someone can endure with loss and, and take art and have it be a healing thing. The real rap of Stephanie uh, emotionally was that last day. And, and on that day, she had to have the scene with Sam. She had to discover that Jackson's dead, play the piano, and crash the posters in the hallway. <laughs> so it was a really, really trying day. And I was happy she actually left before Jackson killed himself. I, I don't even know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I relived so much of my life with you in such a small period of time in a new way. And there was a mourning period, you know? I, I was really mourning. Like, when when I knew what you were doing in that last scene, like, I, I knew it was happening. I also had just per performed all those scenes having known that you were already gone. And that, that last day that we wrapped, it was like <sighs> of, of emotion. Bradley, I don't really know what to say to you because you took a chance on me even in like a very strange time in my life and you brought me back to life. And you made a dream come true for me that I thought was lost. I am Allie. I was that girl that couldn't get the job and you gave me my fucking job, man. Thank you. <laughs> She had an incredible day and there were tears. And then I, and we're about to shoot the scene. I walk into the truck and I open the door and there's roses on the seat that she had left for Jackson. And I was like, ugh, oh, God damn it, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> this movie, if you boil it down, is about one thing, that we need each other and that we're stronger when we're, when we're with each other and holding each other and caring for each other. There's something about seeing people fall in love. And there's something about the ascension of celebrity, like this idea that this person can go come from obscurity and, and become famous. And there's something about mentorship and the loving relationship where one person teaches another person how to become their best self. I think that those, that those themes would resonate powerfully in a culture like ours. We made the movie we set out to make that first day. I, I love what we created. I love, I love what we created, and I also know that like we created something that was even more. It's just extremely powerful.
Before A Star Is Born, Bradley Cooper spent six months with a dialect coach trying to imitate Sam Elliott's voice. Now, this was before he even knew Elliott was going to be cast as his on-screen brother. Cooper worked on his character's voice for four hours a day, and when Elliott agreed to be in the film, Cooper responded, thank God he said yes, because I would have had to rewrite the whole thing. Six months of work on my voice would have gone down the drain. Do you like my shirt? You can get one for yourself in the link in the description.